Hey guys, welcome to the London Lift Podcast. Today we've got a timely episode for you all about how to pick a strength program. At this time of year, a lot of people are setting their goals for the next year and a lot of people often want to get stronger. So in this episode, we're going to run you through some of the classic old school strength programs, give you our experiences, we've tried most of them, and give you our thoughts on how to decide which one might be best for you so you can understand the key principles of programming, strength, and maybe think about how you want to go about achieving that strength goal for 2023. But before we get into it, as always, a big thank you to our show sponsors, thetrainingstimulus.com. Please check out the website if you're interested in learning more about movement mechanics. We've got some exciting upgrades to the mentorship coming for 2023, including some in-person stuff, which I'm really excited to share. Also, thank you to wit-fitness.com. Check out the website and use discount code LL15 to get 15% off your wit kit. And Hytro, use our discount code LL20 to get 20% off your blood flow restriction apparel. Right. Let's get into it. Rob, strength programs. It's your forte. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've uh, when when you started listing out a lot of these, <clears throat> I realized how many I have tried over the years trying to find the thing that works best for me. And now when I look at how I program and kind of like how I program for clients and stuff like that, I realize how I have taken so many like little nuggets from each one of kind of kind of create my own like essentially methodology to kind of work people to their best potential through their to through their strength journey. And um yeah, I loved it because when there are there are so many programs out there, and I guess obviously for you and me, the fact we do individualized programming as well, it just shows that science, this is like a really generic follow this and you'll get stronger. But then mm. you've got us, which will then say, actually, no, what we can do is we can make sure we can get the right thing for you and get it specific to the athlete to make sure they get the best gains possible for their body. And it's then guess I guess it's knowing when when you should do one of these programs, which is what we're gonna go through today, what these programs actually teach you and mm. what they include. So how many have you done over the years? Like, what have you done? Um starting strength, I think I did for a little while. Five through one I did for a long time, juggernaut I did for a long time, and when I was back at uni I did the twenty rep milk and squats program as well, <laughs> which was probably when I got to my biggest. Um yeah, so a, a few of them. We'll, we'll go into the details if you haven't heard of those just yet. How about you, mate? What's, uh, what's on yeah. your repertoire? Pretty much something similar, but as in starting strength, five through one. I've never done juggernaut. Um, I've done the Russian Russian cycle and Smolov. And I'd, I'd done 20 rep squats, not quite like what you did, but I did like mm. a doing 20 reps as heavy as possible often like every week in my in my squats um german volume training which isn't really strength training per se but it's mm. kind of following along those same kind of principles but yeah it's 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 been really interesting because what it's taught me is how to follow a program yeah and then what it, what it actually gives you at the end and that's i think a lot of people with today's kind of like expectations of like training i see things on social media this means i must be this strong or this quickly you're like there's a lot of nuance behind that and a lot of like a lot of time spent under the bar and i think when you follow a program or some like uh, or say like an individualized program and you actually see it through you mm. realize that okay they work most things do work and i think that's why why we wanted to break down today what maybe things might be missing from some of these programs or maybe things that we feel they do really well yeah, I think that's it. These these programs have stood the test of time and people mm. know them because they have got a lot of people a lot stronger. And I think, like you say, the first benefit that it sounds almost too obvious to say, the first benefit that following a program gives is that you are following a program. <laughs> yeah. So your training becomes structured, it's progressed, and um, you turn up and you know what you're doing every time you go to the gym, which for a lot of people is new. Like you might just be going... I remember talking to my brother when he just started going to the gym and he would just go and do the machines, like whichever <laughs> yeah. ones were free, he'd yeah. try and do all of them and do yeah. like two to four sets that were tough. And that like, compared to doing nothing is amazing, but that will only get you so far and having that structure. So you know exactly what you're doing when you turn up, you can almost start visualizing your session before you get to the gym. Cause you're like, Oh, I know I've got this session on Wednesday and 
mentally prepare for a tough session, but you also know exactly what the criteria you need to achieve are in the gym. And it removes the thinking part of training, which I think a lot of people really benefit from is that if they turn up and they're just told what to do, uh, they can push themselves a lot harder and it uh, has a very clear success criteria rather than training until you're tired or mm. just sort of aimlessly wandering around the gym. So having that structure is a huge win, first of all. The second thing is having progressive overload built into the plan mm. in, with a big picture in mind rather than just day to day, week to week, having potentially like a whole year mapped out for you. I think um, gives you a lot of buy-in into where you're going because you can see how things are progressing over time. And yeah, it's a huge, huge win for, for most people to have that level of thought applied to their training. Yeah, because I think, like you said there, when people go into the gym without that, it's <clears throat> understanding how much intensity to push and when. And mm. because a lot of these programs have factored in like full whether intensification, just general uh, period, um, progressive overload, the deloads, like all these opportunities for you to essentially keep getting stronger every session you're coming in, whether that might be actually using a little less weight, say deloading the body and maybe doing mm. a bit more volume or adding more load over uh, the progressive weeks. So it's, <clears throat> I think it's a really good educational tool. And I think someone is starting out in their journey or if you've never followed a program, I think it's a really good thing to do. I really, I really do because okay. you've got a low cost uh, barrier of entry. So it's just, you, it's a free program online. Some of them have really good apps that you can just use. Mm. Like I know Hannah used the 531 app um, and that that's what she does. Every time she goes into the gym, that was the only thing that was really programmed for her that she knows she'll do either squats and bench or deadlifts on the other day. And then everything else would be, oh, and strict press. Um, but everything else was just like what she kind of felt like doing for like, say, the lower body or the upper body based on, say, what yeah. was available in the gym because she went in peak time in training. Um, now yeah. she obviously has a bit more free reign with a home gym and stuff. But generally, she wanted some structure and the rest was a bit more free ball. Which was, yeah. which is for me, I think what five three one is is great for because it just adds yeah. just enough to give you direction, but not give you everything. So, <clears throat> yeah, exactly. I think that's it. You've got the big rocks in the jar first, so you know mm. that your main movements are progressing week to week, and anything on top is a bonus. So, maybe that's a good place to start. Five three one. We've referenced it a few times yeah. already. Uh, so, I think for those of you who are not familiar with five three one, it's a classic barbell program from Jim Wendler and it's called 531 because that's the focus of each block and session yeah. um it's very much around sets of fives threes and ones and uh yeah what's your overall thoughts on 531 and to give us a little bit more detail as to how it how it breaks down because I know it's very similar to your Rob strength method. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I didn't take it from anywhere. But for, for <laughs> me, no, five three one um, is probably one of my favorite strength training programs because it's one of the easiest things to do and to commit to because you could just do it for your squat, just for your deadlift, just for your bench press, your strict press, or you could do it for all the lifts if you've got enough time in the week. And because it's relatively low volume, it's not too much co like commitment. It's mm. just it's so easy to get people to to do it. And yeah. having it's it's a based on a cycle of three weeks on, one week off. And in that one week off, it's a deload, which is normally around like say like tens around that sort of range. If I remember rightly, was it fives? I, I think can't. it's it might actually be fives. So I think it's three by five. It is, isn't it? A lighter like, weight, yeah. Because I'm yeah. basing it on my one. Um, so, but the where I, I even know that I think Jim Wendler said himself he would have actually pushed it out to six weeks and then one week off rather than the every three and one because you, you're deloading too often. And obviously, we can go into yeah. deloads a little bit later. But like overall, the three week on, one week off method kind of works well for most people because most people like to work in like month blocks anyway. And mm. it kind of follows that kind of structure. And then you also have an opportunity to max out. So like you build to something pretty heavy on, especially when you get into that heavy one. Um, mm. And yeah, and I think because everything is based off of 90% of your max, if you know what your maxes are, yeah, it means you're a lot less likely to miss lifts. And that's yes. what 
I think is one of the most important bits about strength training. And it's like when it's, it's just to not miss your lifts. And I know that like, I'm pretty sure over in like the Chinese weightlifting team, like they do not miss lifts. So they say, if you miss lifts, you're done. Like they yeah. just, they don't train to that because you're not training for failure. You're training to be better. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that's a, a huge key feature for five through one and also juggernaut in that you work from, a training max so whatever your one rep max is you use 90 percent of that to then work out the percentages that you use in session and basically it's just a way to make people check their egos mm. and work at a lighter weight than they would like to so because you're saying oh yeah i'm working off my 90 percent, not your one rep max it justifies using a lighter weight mm. and it's it's hilarious because you know 90 if you just use 90 percent of your one rep max and then work out your working weights you could just make those smaller percentages yeah. of your one rep max and it would yeah. be a one step calculation but Jim Wenders obviously done it in that way so that people don't realize how low a percentage they're actually using compared to the one rep max mm. and a bit more detail in sort of the structures in that the first session in a block will be three fives so you basically warm up yeah. to do three fives and the last set is always a max out set so you just rep yeah. out um, at 85%. as many as you can yeah. yeah and then next one is three threes yeah and then the next session would be first working set would be five next working set would be three and then the last working set would be a one plus set so at least one but do as many as you can and this is similar to juggernaut in that that last set being a max out set where you push yourself to basically do as many reps as possible gives you that getting close to well, hopefully getting to a safe failure which really pushes your mm. threshold which would be one of my criticisms of other strength programs in that if the rep range and the weight isn't right it could be too much or it could be not enough yep. to get a good stimulus. Whereas here, because you're using sub-maximal percentages and you're maxing out by reps, you're guaranteed to get close to your actual capacity. So you'll always get a stimulus to develop. And because there's that fluctuation of lower, medium and high percentage weights, you're not always slamming like mm. super high end CNS in that, uh, that one, uh, that heavy single week. So, yeah, I think a lot of people love 531 and for very good reason because it ticks a lot of boxes, super simple and uh, yeah, has a nice gradual progressive overload built in. Yeah, for me, like the AMRAP sets is were are like the most important part for me because it's just for learning your ability to push and push through discomfort and knowing that mm. you've got a minimum that you have to achieve is a really nice way to give yourself a ballpark figure of what you're going to do. And <clears throat> this is where I then put my own spin on it for my own strength method for most people because I felt even though working to 90% is easy enough to do, what I gave people the opportunity to do was based on the individual turning up that day. So rather than you saying you have to build up to 85% and then hit that for five or more, what I said is you're going to build to a heavy five in week one, build to a heavy three in week two, and then build to a heavy one in week one, obviously leaving a little bit in the tank, and then do your back off sets based off that. So in uh, week one, it was build to a heavy five and then back off uh, to 85% for five, 75% for seven and then 65 percent for nine plus so then that's when i'm within I, I use it as a way of size and strength so i'm mm. getting a lot of volume but i'm basing it off of a max of the day so then yeah. it's a base on the individual that i am that day and then the nine plus say so in, in that week is then gives me an opportunity to really say send myself to somewhere very uncomfortable at a lighter load so I'm yep. still going to get a similar sort of response, not necessarily top end strength, but I did that at the start of the session rather than at the end of the session. So this is kind of where I base my whole strength that is on that. And then in my in my fourth week deload, what, what that is, it was just then five sets of 10 at 50% of the week before. So I then use it more as like a volume week anyway. So it's like a tiny bit of a deload because obviously it's lighter weight, but then it gave me, well, it gave people the opportunity to then also do some volume like 50 reps mm. of an exercise is a nice amount of work and most people don't do that so it was, it was yeah. a it was a nice way to kind of tick off some size training as well yeah i think it's a nice way of, of approaching things because 
probably the common pitfalls with five through one is one not being humble enough to use 90 percent and <laughs> yeah i never pressed the heavy. button on the app i was always was like no no i'm gonna work off my 100 <laughs> percent." yeah and and that, that basically means you don't get enough reps no. out and we talked about this before i think where if you're working at a lighter weight and you do a max out set by reps every rep you're shaving off a thinner slice of your work capacity whereas if you're working at super high percentages the difference between doing one rep and two reps is mm. massive Whereas doing the difference between five and six isn't so much and the difference between like nine and 10 is even less. So it means you're taking smaller chunks out of your max max capacity. And uh, that's just safer at the end of the day, because if you're trying to do your one rep max twice, yeah. it's very likely something's going to go wrong. Whereas you're doing your 10 rep max 11 times, for example, it's much less likely that something's going to go really wrong because it's not such a huge ask to do that extra rep. Yeah, and the main reason I come up with my strength method was mainly because it's like I was looking at my clients who were really enjoying following 531, but then they were coming to me having a really stressed day, feeling a bit beaten up just like from work and life stress. And they were just like, and they wanted they wanted the idea of still working to like, I know I'm going to build something quite heavy. So they love having that side of structure so they can, as I, like yep. we mentioned earlier, the positive is having something to mentally prepare for. But then taking away a bit of stress of a number specifically and saying, right, mm -hmm. this is a range that I'm going to get you to kind of work towards. So you're going to be around, say, 82 and 87% roughly to kind of keep people in check when they need to be so they're not going too yeah. far, but then give them a, a minimum for the day. And then they feel like they've achieved on it so they don't feel bad when they leave the session. They, they're yeah. feeling like they're, they're getting stronger because they most likely are. But even if they don't, they've still hit the heavy fight for the day based on the individual that's there that day. Because that mm. at the end of the day, the stress on the body doesn't matter whether it's from a barbell or from the office. It's still the stress that your body's having to take on and, and deal with. So the fact yep. we're then loading ourselves up with uh, with heavy loads and stuff is, is, is great. But we still have to deal with that stress. So if we've taken away that stress, that, say, 80%, 80 will probably feel like 85% today. So exactly, yeah. It allows a bit of room for it's big picture. auto regulation. Yeah. 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 Spot on. So, yeah, I think the uh, nice segue from five through one is a very similar program, which I did for a long time uh, Juggernaut Strength. Mm. And it has a very similar format, but it's a much longer program in that it basically maps out a whole year um, into macro and meso cycles. And it has a essentially got a couple of higher rep um months at the start of the program so you have a month of tens and eights mm. before getting into the fives and the threes and then if you're going to peak for competition getting even lower and one of the things that they're big on at juggernaut is having like a hypertrophy phase before you get into like a peaking phase and essentially laying foundations from which to develop more absolute strength so the first session will be five sets of 10 uh, uh, i think yeah might be wrong but something like something like 65 percent or 60 or 65 percent mm. again going off a 90 percent of your one rep max and the key feature that's the same as five through one is having a max out set on the last set of every session so you do four sets of 10 and on the fifth set you do as many as you can and you might be able to get a lot of reps given it's so light so you're one getting a lot of reps in to practice the skill two lots of volume simulates a little bit of hypertrophy but then three you're absolutely emptying the tank so you're actually building mm. movement specific fitness so if imagine you're doing it with deadlifts you're doing mm. 50 maybe even 60 deadlifts at a moderate weight by the time you drop the volume down and the weight goes up you're actually very fit in yeah. deadlifting because you've done a lot like you that five by ten with the max out is actually one of the most grueling sessions because you <laughs> are so so drained by the end of it um, and then you kind of repeat the same structure. You, you might, I think it's, I don't know if it's five or four sets of eight in month two, but essentially each month the weight goes up and the volume goes down. So it's higher intensity, you have an intensification phase. And then I think it's six sets of five again with a max L and then maybe like seven or eight sets of three in the fourth month. And it's again, just a nice way to get people to work at appropriate weights and, and get to that near failure point 
through max outs rather than failing because it's just too heavy to get off the ground. So it's a very similar thought process to five through one, but the one of the downsides to it is it's very complicated like in terms of adjusting your percentages and you have to recalculate your training max every month. So when you go from tens to eights, you're supposed to recalculate and then redo it. So I did this when I was still consulting and literally had to create an Excel spreadsheet <laughs> to sort of work it all out because it was so yeah. complicated. Um, but it's really nice, gradual. You get a a nice blend of different stimuli in that mm. yeah, the tens is very different to the threes, but I've used it with a lot of people and got great strength results with all of them. The one caveat I have for that is that for the inexperienced lifter, the fives and threes are quite low return yeah. Yeah. effort invested because they're not good enough at the movement. They perhaps don't have the ability to generate as much tension yet. So especially hypermobile people who haven't got much strength training background, the fives and threes, you'll just see a massive sudden drop off. They'll just hit failure very, very quickly and won't get as much of a productive session out of the higher rep sets, which I think is a, a feature across training in general. But yeah. 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 yeah I think, in, I think in general, like most beginners shouldn't really do like these threes, especially like I'm all right with fives, to be honest with you. I, mm. I don't mind fives, but like anything below five for a beginner, as you say, you just, you don't know how to create sufficient tension to lift sufficient load to get sufficient stimulus from it. So, it, I'm a that's I've I've never done juggernaut, but I've I've known about it, and it's just I've always loved the tens and the eights because I I think that's most people when they start training should be doing eight plus reps anyway to grease the groove of understanding how to perform a lift, even yeah. because I'm gonna then kind of contradict myself here, but bracing for a heavy one to a heavy three is different maybe for, than to say a heavy five for how hard and how t how much you have to brace. However, mm -hmm. the idea of bracing for say say fives or eights and say like that is that it's time under tension. So then mm -hmm. your brace will get sufficiently harder anyway as you get later in the set. So you're learning what it's like to say brace under fatigue. And yeah. that's a skill in itself. And I feel learning how to then stay tight with relatively say heavy loads as you're getting fatigued for me when i think about lifting a heavy one that type of feeling is a very it's a very similar feeling for me when i think about a, a, a fatigued brace and a heavy one brace that same because i'm having to work mm. so hard for it and <clears throat> but yeah I, I i can't comment on how it feels which is a shame I, I probably should try and run this at one point but i think i've been doing it long enough to know kind of roughly what the, the stimulus will be like but yeah mm. i'm a big fan of the tens and the eights yeah, and I think that's a really good point for the on the threes for beginners, which leads me nicely to starting strength, mm. which is one of the programs a lot of people do when they're just starting out by Mark Crypto. And it's basically squat bench dead, overhead press, and power cleans as well. Nice, steady, linear progression. You basically have simple program, uh, simple set structures, and you just do the same sessions again and again and again, looking to add weight to the bar every single time. And with anything like this, where it's very simple, linear progression, same rep ranges, it's brilliant in that you make really clear, straightforward progress until you don't. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's called starting strength for a reason. It's, it's a nice exposure. But I think when you have this, so like deadlift, you do one set of five, mm. right? And you do one set of five, um, track it, and then hope to put weight on the bar every single time. And that for a beginner can happen until it doesn't. Mm. And when it stops, when you stop being able to just keep doing a heavier set of five week to week, um, it doesn't, my criticism, and it's it's not designed for this. So it kind of, Mark Rupert would probably just ignore me because it's, it's, not, <laughs> it's not designed for that. But it doesn't give you levers to pull to keep making progress. Yeah. So five through one, Juggernaut, they have obviously the, different phases the different rep ranges and the max out sets so because of each of those things slightly shifting from month to month you are always able to progress in some way shape or form because you're doing less reps you mm. should be able to lift more weight and because you're doing a max out set you're always working 
close to your limit. Whereas one by five, if you did one by five at 100 kilos, trying to do it at 105 or 110, you're probably going to fall short somewhere. And having a few more different levers to pull, like you might not be getting more weight on the bar because you're just not very good at deadlifting. Mm. And if you're only doing five reps, five working reps in a session, especially for a beginner, you're not getting enough practice of the movement to yeah. actually just develop the skill. So even though it is for beginners, I think most beginners would benefit a lot from higher rep, higher volume programs, potentially at lower percentages, even though percentages aren't stipulated to get really good at the movement. And like Rob was saying, the skill of lifting heavy, low rep sets mm. is tough. So if you're completely fresh to strength training, then it might not be the the program I would actually recommend. Yeah, I mean, like starting strength to me, it, it I ran it for such a short amount of time because I just I didn't feel it was doing enough for me, and it was right at the start of my strength journey. So it's like it was it was fine, but it, what I felt it did do was just expose me to squat, bench, deadlift. I didn't and overhead press. It didn't expect because I didn't do power cleans then. So like I did just those barbell movements and what that then done, that gave me confidence in just lifting. I was like, okay, cool. I can lift, but I quickly moved on to the next one, which I will probably talk about is five by five because mm. then that kind of picked up the slack of where I felt the volume wasn't sufficient in starting strength. And then I got the ability to go, okay, I'm just going to do five by five on all my lifts, including deadlifts. I know mm. it's not supposed to have deadlifts in it, but I was just like, I'm going to do it anyway. And uh, it paid off now. So all these years later. So, but five by five for me was that the it was just the more volume, simple version of starting strength. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a, yeah, it's a very common evolution that people do exactly that order yeah. of programs and for exactly that reason. Um, and yeah, five by five, if you haven't heard of it, it's exactly what it says on the tin. Yeah. You do five sets of five, squat bench, deadlift. Um, well, it's, three by well? five, it's three by five, isn't it, on the deadlift? Yes. Yeah, because yeah, it is supposed to be three by five, but it was just, I got carried away with it and I really liked doing the extra sets of deadlifts because again, it was something that I was enjoying. So, but the program itself, I'm pretty sure it's three by five on deadlifts and three yep. by, uh, five by five on squat, bench and press, strict press. Yeah. Got you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So super simple. Again, just make sure you're going up in some way, shape or form. Um, do they advise having different weights you're supposed to do the same weight for all five sets is that yeah the that's that's it well so that if, if i remember right before how i interpreted it and how i used to do it was it was five by five and then say at a set weight so i'd build up to say 100 kilos and what it is a squat and try and do all five sets there if i didn't hit my five by five there i'd say I did five 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 four Next week, I'm on the same weight again and did five by five at 100 kilos and try and hit all sets there. So then it technically isn't a five by five because I never looked into the intricate details of what do I need to do. And if that is just like, this is how I'm interpreting the, the program and having a five by five and not hitting my fifth rep just tells me I'm not ready to move up. So it was a nice way of like progressive overload, but also then giving me uh, boundaries to not push too much because if I then go and stick 10 kilos on the bar instead of say five kilos, I'm probably getting maybe like five, three, two, two, two. And it'd be like, mm -hmm. well, that was way too heavy. So then it just shows you're not yeah. getting the stimulus that the program is required. So that's why I found I actually really enjoyed five by five because it was the simplicity of things. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great, great synopsis. And you just reminded me, we've got, our pimp your progressive overload episode mm. for a deep dive into how to break through these sorts of plateaus like if you're if you're doing some of these programs and you're not sure how to advance through them then uh yeah we go into a deep dive on the nuance of when to put weights up when to do more reps and all that sort of thing yeah we'll put the link in the um description box below if i remember <laughs> yeah. So, cool so russian squat again, cycle yeah a little bit more international yeah the uh, <laughs> russian squat yeah. cycle for me was the as so adam madison got me into the guy that got me into powerlifting we all ran um the russian squat cycle and it's essentially <clears throat> a six-week program which is based off of 80 percent for the first three weeks so you do six by two six by three six by two 
6x4, 6x2, 6x5, 6x2, 6x6, 6x2. So you can tell 6x2 ends up being your deload at 80%. So it's just 12 reps. And when you first start the program in the first week or two, you're like, the 6x2 feels heavy. How the hell am I going to do six lots of six at this weight? And you just do. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's great, especially if you do it properly. Then when, after you get into that, you then basically in the final three weeks, go to 5x5, five 4x4, by 3x3, five, 2x2, by 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 and then you build up to a heavy one at 105%. And what's really nice at, at, with this one is your 2x2 two two is you do two sets of two at your old 1RM which I thought was really cool. So that was like at 100% of what your old thing, it was you've just you've done four reps at your old one rep max, which is amazing. And in between each of those is a 6 by 2 so that 80%. Mm. The the one thing that I really liked about this program was it was really good at teaching me that you have to do what's written down. Like you know you have to come in and do the 6 by 2 even if you're feeling a bit shit or you have to do the 5 by 5 this week even if you're feeling it, because you know the program says you need to do it to achieve that number at the end. So what it taught me, because this is still my early days of strength training, that sticking to a program is a good thing to do, kind of like what I mentioned earlier in the earlier in the episode. But what I found is, especially when you start to get to quite heavy weights, so and now mm-hmm. if I was to run that cycle, it would be really hard for me to hit those numbers consistently. So as a as a more advanced strength athlete, I probably wouldn't run it the same way because I it would probably yeah. be it'd be too much and uh, for me to recover in between even my six by twos like just but so twenty five so it'd be me doing six by two at two hundred kilos at the moment every third uh, so three two twice a week basically. And I'm just like and then in between that I'm doing it just that for me yeah. I, my body would just break down. And it's like I'm, I'm sure I'd be able to do it for a little bit. I don't. I'm, yeah. I'm contemplating well, right now as I'm talking about it, but no, I'm joking. I, I probably won't. But it, no, it's <laughs> not because it's just again one of the reasons why I haven't wanted to kind of necessarily look at lifting more than what I've now currently lifted is because the amount of stress on the body and the amount of time it takes to recover from these heavier loads. It's why these high end strength athletes are not constantly pushing those kind of numbers all the time. They're just exactly. not because the amount of time it now takes for you to recover from them. It's difficult. So I think yeah. the Russian squat cycle is great for like an intermediate athlete, someone that wants to exactly. say specialize in their squat, their bench. You can do it with your deadlift and your strict press. I found I, I got a little bit out of it for the deadlift, but I found the recovery side of the thing was probably the hardest part then because then I actually took away it was I changed it to twice a week. So it's not really following the program, but I did six by two, then the six by three, and then rested. So I didn't do the third session because I just, I couldn't recover because I I remember yeah. and I'm just going on here, but I remember I ran it at the start and I had to restart it because I was just like this isn't working. It was it was just yeah. too much for me. So yeah. I, but it worked well on the strict press and the bench press and the squat, and yeah. I, and I feel it worked so well at the time that I needed it because it was teaching me the movement often. So yeah. I knew how to execute that lift. And I'd done so many reps, but just by the end of six weeks, it was amazing. Yeah, so many heavy reps, I think, is mm. the key. And I am not, I've never done the Russian cycle and I'm not the biggest fan of it. I think for a narrow band of people, it's amazing. Where if you're in that intermediate zone where you kind of don't need that many overall reps, like the volume per session is quite low mm. so you're you're proficient at the movement and you want to improve your absolute strength in in the low reps then i think it's great but like you've just said there once you get beyond a certain level of strength it's very aggressive like you're doing a lot of reps at high percentages so not many people can actually handle it and i know a lot of people who've got injured because you turn up and you've got to do six by six at your 80 percent, and you've, you've already squatted <laughs> twice that week yeah. it's a huge ask yeah. and for sure if you follow it to a t you have to have got stronger because you mm. are doing um those heavy percentages and you're gonna hit your one rep max multiple times but that's if you can and a lot of people literally can't so mm. for me this is it kind of illustrates the drawback of these generic programs perfectly in that for some people it's a perfect perfect program because they'll yeah hit their one rep max four times but for a lot of people it's not right like for Mm. a beginner it's high percentages low reps 
and it's going to be very difficult to um, to execute the movement well. Like you will get a lot of pr a practice at the heavy percentages, mm -hmm. which is a, a positive, but because it doesn't have much wiggle room, like if you are beat up, run down, and you're having to do your six by six, mm. you're almost setting yourself up with a low probability of success. So it feels like you're failing the program. Yeah. And it is asking probably too much on a, in a sensible, to, it's, it's not a sensible question to ask of your body. Yeah. You're trying to get very strong very quickly. And it's just not realistic in my opinion for a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, like for me, the reason why I feel it's great for the intermediates is because you haven't achieved your true potential yet. So you've got yeah. so much room to grow. And like what we said, it's not really great for beginners because you just don't know how to execute the lift effectively to get the most out of it. So you, it is the thought of doing And so I just actually had this thought as well that I think where it would kind of fall short or with the six by six week as the example is if you don't know what you're doing and you really grind it out, that opportunity for that risk reward is there of like you most likely get injured. However, if you're a bit more experienced and understand maybe doing two to three sets of six at your thing and understand that actually not doing the full volume of that one, you might be able to get away with it, but then you're not doing the program. So then it's yeah. like, so then you're, then you're, which I even said with my thing with the deadlifts, because it, it didn't really work for it. And it's not, it's called the Russian squat cycle. So, I mean, if, mm -hmm. if you do it for bench press and say a strict press, you can do it probably because the loading isn't that heavy. So the body can recover a bit more and then frequency is good because then you're touching that movement quite often. Mm -hmm. So you get to, you get good at it. But when you're doing anything like with say squats and deadlifts, the recovery rate is so much more that it probably doesn't work as well, especially when it comes to the, the deadlift for the more advanced athlete. And yeah, I feel... For me, as a, I'm glad I've done it and I've run it a few times. But as I said, like just talking about it, it just brings back so many good memories. But I just yeah. then put it into perspective of the weights that I'd be using this time round. I just, no I, I couldn't imagine doing 36 yeah. reps at 200 kilos. I couldn't. I, I, it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. especially after yeah. three weeks. Uh, I think it, it brings up a good overarching point for all of these programs in that these strength programs were designed as people's entire training. Mm. And one of the ways people mass massively mess up is that they bolt on one of yeah. these strength programs on top of another yeah. training program. So they'll do be doing a CrossFit program and just like do Russian before or after <laughs> their main session. And it's a huge, all of these are, yeah, full training programs in their own right. So if you're bolting on three heavy squat sessions per week on top of your normal training, the chances of you recovering well are slim to none so you need to make some sort of adjustment to either well probably ramp down the volume or intensity in both programs to make one normal program overall obviously there's a lot of individual nuance depending on training age and how much work capacity you've developed over the years but in general that's probably the first thing i would ask somebody if they've got injured doing squats in a russian cycle so what else were you doing? Because mm. I don't know anyone who's just done the Russian cycle. It was always on top of another training program. So yeah. Cause it's so demanding. Yeah, you're you're doing six by six, eighty percent and then gonna do a Metcon before or afterwards. So yeah. I rem no chance. I remember like when I was doing this, like I in the weeks three and four. So when you're basically doing the five by sixes and the six by sixes and the five by fives. My training after that was maybe some. Oh, I did. I then did it. I was on the bench press as well, so I did the same thing on the bench. So I was squatting and benching. And then I might do some more accessories after that, like maybe some chest press or some lat pull downs or some shit, because it was back then. But like, I th I'm grateful that I didn't do this alongside some CrossFit stuff later in my training career. I did, and it didn't mm. work out so well at times. But you know, that was that was that's neither here nor there. But for me, I think lastly just on this the hard part for most people with this is if you miss a rep you feel like a failure and that's now ruined the rest of the program because i can't do it unless you can get over it and say cool it is what it is move on to next week and i'm going to keep doing it as i as i as i planned on doing it if you keep missing these top workout ones like these five by fives or four by fours and stuff then it's too heavy for you like that that's just a clear that's a, a glaring obvious thing but 
it might just be that say six, that five by six and six by six come at a time where you had a really stressful day. It didn't take into consideration your lifestyle factors at that moment, and your your just general fatigue that mm. you just couldn't handle that much volume. So if you did get away with it scot free without getting injured, then cool. Then just carry on the cycle as you are. But yeah, I mean, I think as Ash said, if you do manage to actually just do the program, you might get away with it. But when you start adding it, there's a bunch of other things. This reminds me, though, of the next program that we want to talk about, Smolov. And for me, this most people I know that have tried to run Smolov have never completed it because it's just like because of the sheer, like the the loading, the volume. It's just it, your body just it it can't deal with it. And most people I know it, they don't finish it. And it's funny because I was like, right. I'm going to try it. And I remember trying it. And <laughs> as you do, this is back in my um, youthful days. And so Smolov is, <clears throat> it progresses um, with volume and, um, sorry, volume drops and intensity increases over the weeks, over a four week cycle, which is four by nine at 70%. Then it goes to five by seven at 75%, seven by five at 80%, and 10 by three at 85%. I did this for a couple of um, good. I think I think it was about I think it was about eight weeks, and so about two cycles. And what I really liked was I was just that. No, that was it. This is Smolov Junior. Because in Smolov, sorry, this is me. Yeah, I'm remembering now because <laughs> I looked at Smolov first, and all mm. of that is in a week. So Smolov is done in a week. So it's like you end you end the week. It's it's that is it. It's five by seven, seven by five, and ten by three in a week. And that's why Smolov Junior is the one I then took hold of. That was it. So it just reminded me now as so I'm thinking back. And Smolov Junior is is a week of four by nines, five by seven, seven by fives, and ten by threes. So mm. then it was an as an ability to I don't even know if that's right. <laughs> but it is not that's I my just, understanding no no so do a, yeah a week, a week of four by nines, nines yeah each movement yeah and that that is that's i'm pretty sure that's the junior one because smolov was it's all in a week of just as i said a five by seven seven by five and ten by three which is why finishing it just doesn't happen but what i liked about the smolov junior was the fact that it was in quite a lot of volume so i used it as more of like a bodybuilding strength thing so I was able to kind of get a fair amount of volume through the main lifts, and I then I then dropped out the ten by threes by the end of it because I was like I just I was I wasn't getting in, I didn't want to do ten sets of three at the time I was just like I'm spending too long the program was too long it just yeah. it was taking too much time out tra- out my training time because I wanted to do squat and all these other accessories at the time. Yeah, exactly. So I think my main criticism of Smolov, it is complicated as we've just mm. illustrated yeah. it's hard it's hard to recall <laughs> what happens in the program and it has these hard prescribed reps of like this like four by nine five by seven seven by five there's no wiggle room for adjustment within those rep ranges and there's also no wiggle room on the percentages so it's a pro that it's very clear of what you've got to turn up and do but the con is that in real life your capacity fluctuates day to day, as Rob mentioned earlier, depending on what you've got going on in life. So they might be unrealistic targets to hit. So for that narrow band of people, it could be the perfect program at the perfect time. But for a lot of other people, you might have some sessions where it doesn't feel like enough and you have other sessions where it's completely unobtainable to Mm. hit the achieved and prescribed um, session. So whenever you have that set up, it does mean you're you're reducing your chance of success and more importantly you're reducing your chance of feeling like a success yeah as rob said with the the russian cycle if you're turning up and you're missing the prescribed session you think that you're doing it wrong this and there might like to be fair there might be things within your control that you've fucked up and it is your fault that you haven't got it right but when you have a super aggressive program like the russian and, and like the small of there are physiological limits for how quickly people can adapt. And one thing that needs to be said about all of these programs is that a lot of these people are assisted. They are taking performance enhancing drugs. Mm, yeah. So you've got to bear that in mind if you're not, that you probably can't recover as fast as these people can. And that's to round it back to the deload point. I actually use less deloads for most people than is advised in these programs because I'm not dealing with 
performance enhancing drugs um, mm. and I don't have to cycle off and my clients don't have to cycle off and deloads are one of the features of enhanced programs yeah. because you have to acknowledge that yeah depending exactly what phase of what cycle of what drug you're using you can push harder or not so hard so to bring it back around to the small of i think it's nice in that it's very clearly prescribed and it uses the principles of progressive overload but again it's a very aggressive program and if you can't keep up with it what's the point it's not it's not yeah. a realistic program for a lot of people to actually employ um, the principles behind it of like steady progressive overload, decreasing reps as weights go up are correct, but the speed at which it happens, mm. you need to make a decision as to whether you can realistically keep up with it. Yeah, because like small of even like even taking it as like the small of for what it is, like it's essentially a, it's what daily undulating periodization is. That whether like in a week you'll do higher reps, medium reps, and lower reps. So when you are doing say your say four by nines, uh, seven by fives and 10 by threes, you're kind of hitting three different styles of say strength training. So you're going to hit your body in, in a different stimulus throughout the week so that you can recover, you know, going into the next week. I think where the, where this really makes it hard is with those exact percentages, like you've mentioned there, the fact you've give, given 70%, 75%, 80 and 85%, you're like, this is a lot of stress that I've got to put myself under. And I think also like these Eastern programs, essentially like coming from that part of the world, they were pretty manic anyway. Like even like the squat every day cycle where you, you do, you build up to a heavy max of all these different squats continuously. Like I've never done it. I've always been intrigued by it. And again, I'm now, I don't think I will ever do it, but these these programs, I think, as I think I really like the way you put it there. There was a lot of them were for assisted athletes and of pushing themselves to their maxes. And that was basically all they were doing. Like they mm -hmm. weren't then doing day jobs. They weren't doing this. They were able to rest and recover. Some of them might have been, but like most yeah. of them say weren't because they were athletes, like Olympians or, or power, just exactly. power lifters and yeah. stuff. Competitive strength athletes, yeah. which is another thing that we need to bear in mind that if you're not a competitive strength athlete and you want to do other sorts of training, then maybe your program shouldn't be a pure strength program. You can take inspiration from these programs and pick and choose how you allocate some of your time to them. But yeah, if these were designed for predominantly powerlifters, especially mm. like Juggernaut um, is essentially a powerlifting program. Um, cool. So sticking with the theme of difficult to recover from, mm -hmm. we're going to move on to one of my favorites I've done a couple of times, which is the 20 rep <laughs> squat program, also known as milk and squats, because <laughs> it's often paired with the GOMAD diet, which is yeah. drinking a gallon of milk a day, which is what GOMAD stands <laughs> for. Um, it's basically a bulking program. And it's worth the Google if you've, uh, if you've got a couple of minutes to just Google, I think it's 20 rep or breathing squats, because you're doing mm. more breathing than you're doing squatting when you go through the set. Because there's an amazing article written by somebody where there's quotes like, it's time to stop living in tiny town. This is your yeah. ticket to huge bill. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the author just cracks me up. But the, uh, the premise of the Milk and Squats program is you squat three times a week. And I think you start with about 60% so of your one rep max. And you do 20 squats. And the first week is not too bad, but every session, not every week, every session, you're looking to add weight to the bar. So ideally like five kilos to your squat, but anything like two and a half to 10 kilos, for the jump. And I would definitely recommend going on the smaller side for these jumps. Cause say you're squatting Monday, Wednesday, Friday, it's not a lot of time to get stronger, <laughs> yeah. but sticking with the theme we had before, because you're working at relatively light percentages, they are relatively small chunks and fitness is a huge part of these 20 rep sets like mm. like the breathing title suggests it's not your absolute strength that's holding you back but because it's such a long set like all your muscle fibers fast and slow twitch are going to have to pull their weight for you yeah. to get all of those reps up it is brutally tough like as you start getting towards the 80 percent um just they they give you a lot of advice about the psychological side of things like how do you like how do you get under a bar when you know it's going to take everything you have to, yeah. to finish the set and it's just one set um and they suggest like breaking it down into chunks so 
treating the first set as a set of 10, mm. then doing a set of five, then doing five singles or like 10, three, two, five singles. Yeah. Just so psychologically, you just have small chunks to focus on. You're not thinking like, shit, I've got 10 more reps to do. And the, that last one, I nearly failed. <laughs> but I think the thing with the squat and when it's slightly on the lighter side for most strength programs, you can find strength from somewhere. Yeah. Like if you have enough time to compose yourself and breathe, you can, yeah, stand them up. One big caveat, this is predominantly actually a bodybuilding program. So it's mm. the, the, the main goal is putting on size as the, the GOMAD diet suggests. Um, but it is an incredible, incredibly strong stimulus. I think I got the, the biggest I've ever been doing this because I was eating like a horse at the same time as well. But it's super simple. Your squats get stronger and the accessory or the other movements in the program is generally one push, one pull, and one ab exercise. And you do three sets to failure on each of them. So I would do dips, pull-ups, and like weighted sit-ups at the time. And you just do three sets to failure on nice. each of them with only a minute's rest between each movement. So you go dips, pull-ups, sit-ups, dips, pull-ups, sit-ups. So it's incredibly intense, but incredibly quick and efficient mm. once you warm up for your squats you're probably out the gym in like 45 minutes um yeah. maybe even less but you're probably going to struggle to walk down the stairs <laughs> and uh yeah i've never been so exhausted from from training sessions on a, on a regular basis um I, I think i've got an emotional connection to it because i just mm. enjoyed it at the time but i was at university when i was doing it so I had more free time more um like recovery capacity yeah. and I was eating like more than I've ever eaten so, which I think all play and you kind of have to treat it like that because it's so all consuming but um yeah I think use it at your own risk would be my advice yeah I mean I, I've never I've done 20 rep squats before just randomly thrown into like my programming and also I've tried to periodize um like progressively overload to a 20 rep max so I found my 10 rep max and basically turned it into my 20 rep max and that was fun so that <clears throat> that in itself was again an, uh, a take on a program and saying okay cool how can i make this a little bit m more towards what i want to do and i think mm. when we when we kind of look across all these programs i think the main thing that they all try and gear towards is progressive overload and the mm -hmm. fact that we're looking to increase loading over weeks and then probably take a bit of an easy week with the deload, I know you've obviously put your thoughts on the deload there, but like for most 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 people, having a little bit of a deload week, say every cup, like every say according to say Jim Wen and stuff, say every like seventh week or something like that, just having a little bit of time off is just also just mentally quite nice to do. You don't need mm. to, but I think just to go into the gym, say oh, this is an easy week, and I'm gonna feel charged up, ready for the next week, and this is why. I'm, I am a fan of deloads more for the mental side of things rather than what the body needs. I think yep. more for you to go into a gym and say, right, okay, this is my week. I'm going to just do my main lifts and maybe have some then accessory stuff, which I can just get a nice bit of a pump, de-stress, feel good, and then get myself ramped up ready for the next phase. And that's because I found when you are working with some decent loads and stuff like that, you just really crave that bit of time off. And I think that every fourth week is probably a little bit too soon, as I say, Jim Wendler says stuff. But mm -hmm. if you are lifting heavy enough, every fourth week is kind of just right. I know, like with your with like how kind of your thoughts on that is, like I guess if you're loading just the right amount, you can just keep keep going, right? I guess. Yeah, yeah, and also I think life naturally gives you deload weeks. Is the other thing to say is that most people. Um, there's texture hopefully there's some texture to your life and there's things like yeah. holidays or you might get sick or might have a really intense week of work or whatever so there's lots of things that stop you training consistently forever so they'll naturally be lower volume weeks and i think there's two benefits to it and there's that one you don't get stressed when you struggle to train or something imperfect happens it's just like this is just a lower volume week and that means i'll be fresher for next week Whereas if you, you could program a deload week when you've just had one of those situations in life mm. and you don't you don't necessarily need no. the deload week then. So I prefer to be a little bit more flexible yep. on deloading. And of course, if you have a competition or something, you might need to deload after that. Um, but 
it's much more a play it by ear situation than rather than strictly oh we have to have a deload because you really need to yeah. when a lot of people like actually feel great so can't we just train as normal yeah um, no I, I as i said like i i like it <clears throat> as a as i say a mental thing but if you don't need it then you don't need mm -hmm. to take it but the problem is is a lot of the time we don't know when we need it and then it's too late when we do yeah. need it because and this is where True. you do have to ask yourself as in like you so, so again this is going to be hugely biased and kind of how i like to program and stuff like that but like if after three weeks you're feeling good you can run another three weeks and feel good for another three weeks then you probably should have a week of a bit less loading to get you ready then to go for say another three to six weeks mm. just based on the risk of probably you just getting too tired or life getting in the way or maybe not work out like it just takes away some of that risk and again I think we put delos on too much of a pedestal. I think that as an essential thing, and I think that's where, like, even even I'd say you and me are kind of saying very similar things. Obviously, I might say I structure them a little bit more than you do, but we mm. kind of both have them there for the reason of you have them for life when they probably happen naturally. And I say, well, I'm going to kind of put it in if we've gone too long of intensifying things or a yeah. bit too much. So I'm going to say, right, and on that seventh week latest, and we'll take it easy a little bit and then we can go straight back into it. And as I said, you then feel a little bit more recharged. But yeah, go on. I think so. I was just going to say, yeah, that's spot on. And um, the other thing that I think the common theme amongst the, the things we like about the training programs is the fluctuations in volume and intensity. So mm -hmm. you're not always hammering super heavy all the time. Having that slight change in stimulus over like the medium and long term yeah. enables the body to to keep adapting. Whereas you just keep hammering the same thing again and again and again, especially with strength work more than other things, you can get this, yeah, this sort of chronic fatigue, which in the main is good, mm. but when you can have too much of a good thing and people, yeah, neurologically burn out because like, I just can't face the idea of lifting like high nineties um, no. week on week on week, which is why people peak for competition otherwise if that was the best way to train people strength athletes would just be doing heavy singles all, all the time, time and trying yeah. and to wrap them up but the body just can't keep up with that so this is the reason why fluctuating between slightly lighter slightly higher rep sets is a good idea and i think this is also why i say like five three one as as took on as took um been taken on so well by so many people because even if you negate the deload completely, when you go back to fives, you're deloading anyway because you've gone yeah. back to 65, 75, and 85 percent. So, like compared to then going to like your 95 plus percent on that heavy ones week, if you do skip out the deload and then run it again, that's a deload in itself because the body's had an opportunity to lift less weight. And mm. like kind of like harping on about this deload talk still. This is why the I think deload is very individual and you have to monitor your own training and monitor how you are feeling and based on yep. like your numbers and are you missing lifts or are you dreading not going to the are you dreading to go to the gym or all these things that they're little things that kind of make you ask questions. And I guess also the last point on this is what's really good is they make you work off like your ninety percent, which is mm. good. And or, well, a lot of them do, or like your training max, because rather than, so like for me at the moment, if I went into the gym and programmed everything based off my current one rep max squat or bench or deadlift, I'll be working too near failure all the time. Now, sometimes that might be working if you know you're actually underperforming at the moment and you actually want a little bit of a push. And the reason I say this was my whole powerlifting prep I did based off that. I worked off that I had a 300 kilo deadlift. No, I didn't. I worked off that I had a 280 kilo deadlift and a 250 kilo squat. So I said to myself, I already have these numbers. And when I was given my percentages to kind of work off, obviously there was a little wiggle room in there. If I kept missing numbers, then I knew I couldn't achieve. That's not where I'm at. But I was always hitting them week after week. So I knew... My body, because uh, I had this innate feeling of that I didn't just pull 250 out of the air. Like I knew I had that squat based on my last uh, competition performance, based on how squats mm. were feeling. I knew what after all these years of experience that I've had in training, I'm not just pulling this number out of the air. I knew that's what I could achieve. So I based it off of that to make sure I did hit that. And yeah, and then I think and obviously it did what it did. But generally, that was peaking for a competition. 
if I was training, I wouldn't be basing off of that because we had an episode, go back a few, training versus competing versus testing, where we talk mm. about this and it's most people in the gym are constantly either testing or competing rather than actually training. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think, yeah, as an overall overall lesson for most people, the fact that the coaches who wrote these programs are asking you to work off a 90% or a training max mm. tells you that most people are just working too heavy. That's, yeah. that's yeah. all it means. So you'll probably benefit from working at a slightly lighter percentage, doing things properly and accumulating slightly more volume rather than flirting with failure all the time yeah. from a pure, from an absolute strength perspective, because you're still deriving strength benefits, working at lower percentages and higher reps, but there's lower risk and, mm. um, you're not getting anything out of a failed rep. No, to think about and it. I think so this is your opportunity. No, it's, and your opportunity to grease the groove with a slightly lighter weight, so you're actually performing high quality reps continuously, and you're not performing shit. Then mm. that's how we can improve. And then you know, if we're constantly grinding out reps, every time you do a squat, it's going to be different to the last time. So your body doesn't know how to actually squat. It's just getting the f weight from um, fucking standing height to bottom height, wherever it is, to back up. And it, like, if you're doing it any way possible, how can you make that repeatable? How can you make yourself actually get stronger if you don't know how to execute the lift continuously? So yeah. I think all of this wraps up to so you have to ask yourself a couple of key questions, which is yeah. like, what is your goal? What are you working mm -hmm. towards? Are you working towards absolute strength? Do you want to add in some size training, some hypertrophy? Are you looking at body composition or fitness? Do you need to blend them all together? Or can you have periods where you're focusing on just one aspect? So you can actually mm. recover from things. Or do you want to blend it all together and actually get substandard results across the board? Because that might be <laughs> what you want because you kind of want yeah. just a little bit of everything, which is essentially CrossFit, right? Just a little bit of everything and get kind of good at most things. And that's exactly how I like to train. Kind of get a little bit of good at across the board. So yeah, exactly if, as long as you have that as your goal. Yeah, be, just being clear on it, I think yeah. that's the, the key thing is a lot of people think, oh, I want to get my squat up but they're not aware of the trade-offs. So if you're going to do a small off cycle, you think, oh, I'm going to get my squat up, but I also want to keep doing gymnastic EMOMs twice a week. I also want to keep doing Olympic weightlifting. I also want to keep doing like wads every now and then. Yeah. And you need to be realistic with how much you can actually recover from and how much you can fit in time-wise. So having that honest appraisal to say, what do I actually want? What's my mm. actual goal? And what's, yeah, what's the priority if it's like i'm willing to let something slip for a couple of months while i get my squat numbers up so that hopefully when i reintroduce all the other types of training i'm the same roughly the same person but with a bigger squat fine but just having that self-awareness to think yeah can i actually recover from this or not um and my advice on that is always erring on the side of less rather than more. It's better to feel like you could recover from more than just drive yourself into the ground yeah. and have to recalibrate. And it feels like negative, like you're, you're taking backward steps rather than forward steps. Whereas if you do too little and you slowly add a little bit more to find your level, then you're taking forward steps and you're doing more versus, oh shit, I'm doing too much. I have to retreat. And psychologically, a lot of people struggle with the idea of doing less. Yeah, and I, 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 there's there's a point here which I want to kind of say, and I'm gonna also contradict myself in it because I don't know, but like, don't max out all the time. Like you have to do it every yeah. so often. The reason why I'm gonna kind of contradict myself is because when when I think back to my strength journey, I've done a lot of maxing out and quite frequently on lifts I probably shouldn't be doing, and if I haven't got injured from them have they actually been beneficial in making me the type of strength athlete that I am now? And that was because I was younger, I was able to recover more. And as I've got older and got more wiser and just can't recover mm. as much, I have been a bit more erring on the side of like, okay, maybe max out less. So I think I, I, in hindsight, I would say you probably shouldn't max out as much and work a bit more sub-maximally because as we've kind of harped on this whole episode is in working in those percentages where you can execute things really well and maybe do higher reps like AMRAPs at a bit lighter weights probably get you'll get more out of it yeah but the skill in maxing out you kind of need to learn that as well and i learned if you're a strength athlete if you're a strength athlete yeah yeah sorry so that is what and yeah 
uh, yeah, that's actually a very good point to make because I my goal has pretty much always been to be as strong as I possibly can. So I've always kind of uh, on that side of things. But if I was more for my clients, and this is when I look at it more from a subjective view and I look at all my clients, I do not get their maxing out often at all. And even if they do, a lot of the time, say they're heavies, or most of the time, say threes, maybe doubles. Yeah. Very rarely do we go to ones unless someone's specifically looking to get strong for say powerlifting or weightlifting but generally everyone else heavy threes because i do feel there's a space for learning how to brace against really heavy loads and heavy threes mm -hmm. is normally just light enough before you really fuck yourself up yeah and if yeah, you've earned the right to a, be there yeah there's there's a lot to say on this actually like first thing to distinguish is like an absolute max versus like a technical max mm. so if you reach technical failure means your form has broken down you could probably do another rep, but it would be really ugly. So I would never advise accepting competition, going to like a hard, hard failure or getting close with it. If your technique starts to really break down in training, that's probably enough to get a stimulus to get stronger yeah. and minimize risk. But what we're not saying is that you shouldn't push yourself. And I think these AMRAP sets, max out sets, are a safer way to push yourself mm. closer to your limit without the risk of failing heavy singles. So you step like in all aspects of training, except maybe zone two cardio, you need to push yourself so that your body has a reason to adapt, get fitter and stronger. Um, so we'll never say don't push yourself, but mm. the way in which you push yourself, there are opportunities to do it better and worse. And I think just mindless, um, yeah. yeah, like yanking it up, however it happens until you absolutely can't do another rep. Um, the risk reward probably doesn't pay off for most people most of the time. Yeah. And I think just even like, cause that thought that I said there was, it was just a thought at come into my head. So now even having a little bit of time to think on it. And when I used to do those max out say where I probably shouldn't have most of those time was me then thinking I had more in the tank when I didn't. And then I'd end up failing, say like a squat. And I say, just hit 200 and it was a slow grinder. And I was like, I've got 205 and I'll put 205 and I'll get down and just fail. And I think now with, again, through the fact I film lifts and stuff like that, and I've got a, a better training age, I now know what my body can do. When I see the speed of a bar slowing down, I now know it hasn't got that five kilos. Whereas back then I might be more like, yeah, I've, I've got it. I've, I can I can mentally get this extra five kilos. And you're like, nah, you can't. And I think I do think I I, I don't think I've ever just maxed out like foolishly. Well, probably I don't know. I'm going to move on from this point. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I I think that's some takeaways from today because it's been quite a long one today, and I've I've really enjoyed discussing these strength programs because they are famous for a reason you know they're they're, mm. they're loads of people have done them loads of people have had a lot of success with them there's been obviously some not so successful stories that you don't probably hear about as much but yeah they're a nice place to start for people maybe wanting to start their strength journey if they can't quite afford a coach or they haven't got anyone that they can talk to and they just want to look online and go do you know what i'm going to give one of these a go because it could be the start of something and you know you expose yourself to maybe these you know these barbell lifts or say squat bench deadlift and maybe pressing that is a really nice progressive structured way for you to train and if you haven't got any structure at the moment this is a really perfect gateway into getting something started exactly i think that's that's the perfect uh explanation of the business case of these famous old school programs in that if you're going from no program to a program, you're winning. Like that's a massive, mm. massive win to just have consistency, progressive overload built in. So you can see week to week that you are making progress. Like we've touched on a couple of times, erring on the light side. So mm. being conservative with your one rep maxes. Like if you did a small of off of conservative max, you would probably do a lot better just because you're not risking failure so much um, and it's, it's obviously safer and you will still get stronger, yeah. which I think is the thing that people struggle with. As we, we've reiterated a few times, people don't like the idea of working at low percentages, even though a few of these programs are forcing people to do mm. that or tricking people to do that. So there's obviously a good reason for it in that there's still a lot of benefit to be derived from that. Um, hopefully from the episode you've, you've, got an understanding of the points of commonality between these programs like what 
is the same across all of these programs a progressive overload a consistency like repeating the same movements and just having the, the long-term big picture in mind especially things like juggernaut when they're mapping out a whole year mm. in advance just having the patience to slowly increase and that's actually how you build massive strength is over the long term like we talked about with the Smolov and the Russian cycle, when you try to go too fast too soon, that's where things get tricky and it's unsustainable. So hopefully you've got some ideas on what these programs are. If you want to pick one, which one might be most appropriate for you. But if not, you've got a good understanding of programming for strength if you want to adapt these for your own purpose. Um, but as we always say, having that structure so you're not thinking in session you just turn up and execute is a massive massive benefit and i think if you've got somebody else who's written the program you then aren't questioning yourself and your decision yeah. making when you wrote the program which is also a big win like rob used a coach for his powerlifting meet for exactly that reason like mm. he could have written an amazing program for himself but to take that to separate the design and the execution it frees up a lot of headspace and you can just turn up and, and get the job done yeah and like like i did with 531 you know i picked my favorite strength program and adapted it to me and my clients what i felt would be best suited for the people that i work with and people that want to get strong but want to add some size and that's why i then created rob strength method which took in that 531 principle but added in basically auto regulation and that's where f for me i felt a lot of these programs kind of lacked was that auto regulation or understanding mm. the ability of kind of if you need to give yourself ranges of net, maybe not pushing too far because you've got to think big picture but you want to also make sure you've got some minimums to hit because you don't want to just be being lazy and this is it's giving you wiggle room but yeah. really hope you enjoyed today's episode i thoroughly have enjoyed this as well um as always if you do uh, want any more advice on any of these strength programs you can hit me up or hit ash up we will definitely be able to get back to you and kind of maybe give you some more insight into how you could get stronger um if you did enjoy this episode we would love for you to share it as always you know share on social media tag us at lunge.lift apart from that thank you very much for every single week that you tune in we really appreciate you and we can't wait to keep going through 2023 and well, we'll see you next week cheers guys